Buenas tardes, good afternoon to one and all who have joined us today for this webinar. My name is Carlos Vargas Ramos, and I am the Center for Puerto Rican Studies Director for Public Policy, External and Media Relations. Uh, and I will be serving as your Master of Ceremonies this afternoon for Puerto Rican New Yorkers, Workers, Unions and Politics in the Struggle for a Better Life, 1910 through the 1960s, a webinar on this e-journal exhibit by Professor Aldo Lauria. On behalf of Centro, uh, I welcome you. Uh, Puerto Rican New Yorkers, uh, Workers, Unions, and Politics in the Struggle for a Better Life collects a series of blogs that will introduce many uh, of the rich context in which Puerto Rican New Yorkers engage uh, with the larger movements and struggles from the 1960s through the 1970s. It's a mosaic uh, represented here, or the mosaic represented here includes some of the stories uh, that you know, have been collected for these purposes. Um, we are often asked uh, if these presentations are available to the public and the answer is yes, uh, you will be able to access a recording of this entire webinar and their individual presentations uh, on our website, centropr.hunter.cuny.edu, as well as in the website uh, you use to register for this webinar, uh, centropr.nationbuilder.com. You will be able to find in these websites not only today's presentation, uh, but also recordings of previous presentations. Okay. Uh, today's presentation will run in two parts. Uh, one pre-recorded presentation by Professor Aldo Lauria, followed by a commentary uh, from Professor Virginia Sanchez Corrol. Uh, after that commentary by Professor uh, uh, Corrol, there will be another uh, um, presentation by Professor Lauria, followed by another commentary by Professor Sanchez San San Corrol. Before we continue, uh, I would like to invite now Dr. Edwin Melendez, who is the director of the Center for Puerto Rican Studies, for some welcoming remarks and a brief explanation of the initiative this webinar is a part of, the Central E-Journal. Adelante, Edwin. Gracias, Carlos. Uh, saludos. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the second webinar sponsored by the Central E-Journal. Thank you so much to Professors Aldo Lauria and Virginia Sanchez Coro for accepting our invitation. It is our privilege to have two of the best historians of our generation with us in this event. And thank you to Central staff for making the e-journal and the webinar possible. I would like to take a few minutes to explain what is the Central Journal. And for that, I'm gonna share my screen if you're patient with me. The first thing I want to say is that the Central Journal, it's a peer-reviewed uh, journal that publishes original contributions to Puerto Rican history and culture as interactive multimedia digital exhibitions online. And that's what you're going to go through today. One example of how this is applied to labor history and the Puerto Rican community state side. It's a fully devoted to promoting Centro's archival collections and other digital content, as you will see from Professor Lauria presentation. It's devoted to increasing connections to Puerto Rican study scholars, curators, and artists. Uh, it's intended to support historic and cultural preservation and to educate about uh, and to share broadly the Puerto Rican experience in, in the U.S. Uh, we're seeking proposals, so if you have some ideas and you think uh, this is a medium that you like to explore, we like to expose your work, we like to embrace your work. And for that, we have uh, some goals that you should keep in mind. First, uh, the proposal needs to uh, make clear that it's a contribution to historic and cultural preservation. It's also relevant to the field of Puerto Rican studies and the academic community have a connection and uh, to and contribute to the library and the archive, the central library and the archives to the extent that that's possible and have a multimedia content to support user interactivity. And you will see today what some of those features are. In addition, we have an evaluation process that is comprised of three uh, straightforward steps, not unlike any other uh, journal. First, uh, we require that 
potential contributions, uh, uh, contributors, I'm sorry, submit a project proposal. We have a template of that in our website and you can visit our website and fill out the form and send it to us. Second, once the proposal is accepted, uh, we uh, will send it to reviewers, they will make recommendations and the author curators will submit content as detailed as they have in the proposal to the central staff. The central staff will upload it. They're dedicated to help you and, and support that uh, exhibit. Thirdly, uh, once the uploading and copyright clearance uh, is completed, uh, the exhibit is sent to a review panel just to check for, for a final time that it all in line with what we expected. Uh, once the exhibit is ready for publication, we encourage authors, curators to submit a summative and interpretive article about the exhibit to the center journal, the printed version for the section that is called from the central archives. And you will see beginning with the next issue of the central journal, some of those uh, articles for this exhibit being published. Please contact us if you have any questions, our staff will be happy to uh, respond to you and the, uh, the e-journal uh, email is listed there for your benefit. I wanna call your attention finally to uh, the next two exhibits. We already presented one on the military history of Puerto Ricans. Today we're looking at labor. You enjoy that presentation. The next one is about farm workers. It's June 3rd, a Thursday. And we have Ismael, Dr. Gar Ismael Garcia Colon, who actually grew up in our archive for all practical purposes, talking about the Puerto Rican migrant farm worker. He's the leading expert in that field. And he's going to show how do you translate history into uh, exhibits that are multimedia, interactive, and so forth. And finally, uh, to conclude this semester, we have a, a wonderful uh, exhibit uh, from um, Noralise Ruiz, uh, our very own. She actually worked for Centro for over a decade on forceful females, leading artists from the Centro archives. And you see the connection here right away. So with no further ado, I, it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this project, to this effort that tries to uh, uh, make the links between our work at Central and uh, you know, the Puerto Rican studies community and to offer this tool for digital humanities and how they can take advantage of that. So it's my pleasure to let you enjoy this webinar with, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Loria and, and our own Virginia Sanchez Coro. Back to you, Carlos. Now I would like to introduce to you the feature presenters uh, uh, for this evening. We have Dr. Aldo Laurio Santiago, who is professor in the Department of Latino and Caribbean Studies and the Department of History at Rutgers University, the New Brunswick campus. He is a historian of the Central America Mexico, the Caribbean, and Latinos in the United States. He specializes in patients, working class history, uh, I'm sorry, peasant and working class history, revolution, ethnicity, and race. He received his doctorate from the University of Chicago and his master of arts in Latin America and Caribbean studies from New York University. He trained as a Mexicanist at the University of Chicago, but he began his career as a historian of El Salvador. But he has devoted the last uh, few years to really digging up the uh, history of Puerto Ricans uh, in the United States. Uh, followed by uh, Dr. Uh, Laurea's uh, presentation will be a commentary by our own Dr. Virginia Sanchez Corro, who is Professor Emerita at the Department of Puerto Rican and Latino Studies at Brooklyn College, City University of New York. Dr. Sanchez Corro writes about the Puerto Rican experience in the United States. Among her extensive publications, she has authored The Path Breaking from Colonia to Community, The History of Puerto Ricans in New York City, and co-edited Latinas in the United States, a historical encyclopedia. She is the recipient of the Herbert H. Lehman Prize for Distinguished Contribution to New York History in 2020. She serves a historical consultant to media projects 
government and cultural institution. She is the co-editor of Puerto Rican studies in CUNY, the first 50 years, which is forthcoming uh, this year. Again, uh, I want to remind the audience that you have the, op the opportunity to engage with these scholars by asking questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, uh, please, you know, we will see the chat, but we will not be fielding questions from there. Uh, with that, without further ado, we will then go on with the presentation uh, by Dr. Aldo Laurio Santiago. Hello, thank you for joining us in this webinar. I'm very excited about presenting this work. It's been a long time in the making, and um, I'll be describing the blog website at Centro in two parts. The first will be up to the 40s, 1940s, and the second part will be after the 1940s. I'll describe the origins of the project and the influences and ideas, and a little bit about the themes and documents that are represented. The blog site is inspired by research on working classes in New York City. And at some point, I found that there wasn't a lot of research on Puerto Ricans in New York through the lens of labor and unions and work, uh, especially for before the 1960s. Right. So I began research on this project maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, more or less, uh, doing uh, work in different archives, including collections held at the Centro, but also dozens of collections of archives uh, of um, unions, solidarity groups, socialist groups, communist groups, progressive groups. Um, and and many other pieces randomly that I found in other places. Um, the focus has been on kind of a spectrum of traditional labor history, which is focuses on unions with um, questions of work and economic survival, which is more of a community perspective. And, and then also working class politics which involves larger politics in the city, alliances, support, and zooming out a little bit to the community life of Puerto Ricans as workers uh, or middle-class people. Um, and um, in the other projects that I'm working on, uh, books that hopefully will be published soon, I discuss other aspects of race and color and neighborhood uh, as part of the life of working class people. Uh, the blogs here cover a little bit more of the traditional themes that probably would be familiar to people that have uh, read, read a little bit of history of Puerto Ricans in New York. Uh, and I'll describe some of the themes uh, for you. Uh, the first essay emphasizes the kind of multi-class history of migration. Uh, and that's something that I emphasized throughout my research that the Puerto Rican community was actually very diverse. And the migrants or the experience of the community produced people of different class backgrounds and different income levels and different work experiences. The section is called the middle class of empire. I emphasize that the first visible community of larger numbers of people uh, in the early 1900s, in other words, right after the US occupation of Puerto Rico in the 1800s and eight, I'm sorry, 1900s and 1910s, um, were people linked to the increasing connection economically between Puerto Rico and the US. And therefore, a lot of them were entrepreneurs and uh, clerks and teachers and um, and that after that, World War I began the kind of larger scale migration of workers. The blog that follows discusses cigar makers, and that's a very traditional theme in the migration literature. I was able to find a few more sources, especially around uh, the work of Bernardo Vega and cigar union organizing, including the big strike of 1919. 
Um, I try to put cigar making in perspective in the terms of the community because it was actually one of various. And soon enough, by 1920, most Puerto Ricans worked in other things other than cigar making. But cigar making was an important part of the community and was kind of the heart of the proletarian character of the emerging Puerto Rican community. The next blog covers socialist politics, and that means the socialist politics that came from the island associated with the Partido Socialista and all the different leaders, and the socialist politics that come out of the uh, U.S. Socialist Party, which with which the one on the island was affiliated. And these are very complicated politics in the 1920s, uh, some of which have to do with the status of the island, but especially questions of labor solidarity, uh, including significant participation in working class movements in the city itself, and some internal discussions over improving the participation of Puerto Ricans uh, in their own workplace organizing including cigars, right? The next section includes the depression, which has some unusual features where I included some personal narratives, these summaries of personal narratives of individual migrants and how they experienced the 1930s. I also cover the emergence of union organizing, especially as women enter the labor market, especially in garment. So there's a fair amount of material there on different unions that Puerto Ricans participated in. And the next section includes how in the 1930s, Puerto Ricans and many other New Yorkers became more radicalized through the Communist Party and eventually the American Labor Party as part of larger working class movements. And that's an emphasis in my research is the, 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 the things that connect Puerto Ricans to other Latinos uh, and to other workers, right? And, and based on especially kind of visions of a, of a working class idealism, right? Um, and so in the 1930s, the Communist Party comes more firmly into the story, uh, and the Puerto Rican workers developed by the late 1930s, what I call the Hispanic Popular Front, which was a workerist, labor solidarity, progressive world of politics and culture shared with other Spanish-speaking people, led by Puerto Ricans, with various branches, including newspapers and solidarity with the Republic in Spain during the Civil War, uh, anti-fascism, and involvement in union and leftist politics in New York City. Right? After this comes the discussion of the clubs, the IWO clubs that were part of the left world. And Jesus Colon plays a really big role in both the Communist Party and the Hispanic Popular Front and the IWO clubs, the International Workers Order. This kind of labor politics, as others have noticed, came into crisis in the mid to late 40s and pretty much disappeared by the late 40s under pressure from conservative politics, repressive measures from the government, uh, and sort of dissolved. Right? And this is happening at the same time as Puerto Rican migration <clears throat> is expanding again in the immediately post-war years, right? And that is the subject of the next batch of blogs, which I'll describe separately. Well, thank you, first of all, for the wonderful introductions that, uh, that, that, that you have done for, for both of us. And, um, and hi, everyone in the audience. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, if you have looked through Aldo's uh, blogs and uh, the materials that, uh, that have been uh, circulating for, uh, for a number of uh, days now, uh, you know that there is a great deal of information uh, uh, to be covered. And um, I was fascinated by it, of course, you know, being a historian and looking at the history of Puerto Ricans in New York City. I mean, this stuff should be flowing in all our veins. We should know this. Uh, we should know this right off the bat, but we don't, but we don't. And so this is one of the important reasons why uh, 
his uh, his work is so is going to be so so necessary and so useful to those of us who are uh, still in the classroom or doing research. Uh, the way that I'm going to tell you the way that I approached uh, looking at that, reading the blogs, I, I looked at the pictures a lot. I looked at the images, and I remember particularly the image of the tobacco workers sitting around the table. Uh, the I looked at that picture and put myself into it. Looked at these people and thought to myself, "Well, you know, uh, we are here because they were there, but those looks on their faces are are difficult to read." Uh, is it, are, there, are there looks of resignation? Are there looks of anger? Uh, what is going on at this particular time, the 1920s, right after World War I? Uh, jobs are scarce. Uh, veterans have come back and, um, and the tobacco industry is in trouble. Uh, they have a right to look sullen. They have a right to look uh, resigned. Uh, they have a right to, to look determined. Uh, because they're competing, they're, the, the, the idea, as, as Professor Laudia just pointed out, the, um, it, it, the ideologies around uh, workers' organizations is shifting. Uh, the, uh, the industry itself is changing. Uh, there are, for example, uh, there is the popularity of, uh, of cigarettes, uh, that, uh, and, and cigarettes are, are, are mechanically produced. Uh, there is talk of uh, the wages are too low. Uh, and one of the things that he says that I really liked is that the whole image that we have of tobacco workers that comes from Bernardo Vega, that comes that talks about the reader and the tobacco factory. I mean, th that sounds like a, like, like a stroll in the, in, 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 in a, in the park. Uh, the working conditions were not great. Uh, there was a lot of illness uh, resulting from the the the, uh, the residue of, uh, of working with tobacco. Um, the wages were low, the conditions were bad, and uh, people needed work. And in addition to this, we have we have uh, uh, factory owners, we have management talking about uh, the uh, production of cigars, a mechanical production of cigars with new technology. The new technology is going to produce so much more, so many more uh, cigars, and able to sell them much cheaper. And, and guess what? Even women could work the machinery. And you know that women are gonna work at much less, a much lower salary than the men are getting. Um, so talking about women in labor uh, reminded me, and, and this is one of the things that, that, his, that, that uh, Dr. Lauria's uh, uh, work tends to do. It brings other images into your head. And so I started to think about uh, Luisa Moreno. Um, Camacho, could you have, do you have that slide of Luisa Moreno? Could you run that? Um, uh, look at this. I want you to be able to see very, very clearly uh, that she is, uh, she is, she is brought to exile. She is brought to the point of deportation, and she is deported uh, because she was a militant union leader. This woman is threatened with exile. Uh, Luisa Moreno goes into exile. She is one of the major figures in uh, in women in labor movement uh, during the '30s and the '40s. And uh, I can only think of two other women that are as prominent as she is. And one of them is, of course, Dolores Huerta and uh, Luisa Capetillo. Um, uh, but Luisa Moreno is in New York City in 1933. And she comes to New York City. She goes to live in, in, in El Barrio. Uh, she's, got, uh, she's newly married. She has an infant. Uh, her husband is an artist, so he's not, he's not doing any, any kind of steady work, but she is because she has to go and work. She works, gets a job in, a, in, a, uh, in the garment industry. And for the first time in her life, she realizes the conditions and the exploitation affecting the women workers uh, in, in this industry. And she, uh, she begins to try to help, to organize, to she finds, she's appalled. She's appalled at, 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 at the conditions. She's appalled at the wages. And um, Luisa Moreno does not get involved in organizing, in union organizing, while she's in New York. 
But three years, 1930s, 1939, a few years later, uh, we find her in the Midwest. She is organizing the first major uh, organization uh, to, um, to fight discrimination against Latinos. And that's one of the things that, that she becomes very, very adamant on. Uh, and that is a Congreso de, de Pueblos uh, de Habla Español. Uh, she also becomes a major union leader for the AFL and is called in to settle one of the largest uh, women workers, workers strikes in San Antonio, and those are the pecan shellers. Um, so, um, so I thought about that, and I thought about the testimonials, which, which immediately will grab your interest because they're the stories of people. And I thought about Antonio Sanchez, the person who was so instrumental in helping me with the research on Colonia to Community, and, uh, and, and how he had to, uh, in 1936, get a job uh, with the WPA. Uh, he had a sick wife, uh, a new infant. Uh, he could no longer go out to sea in ships because he would be away from the family too long. Social services, not social services, Catholic Charities was threatening to take the child away because there was no one to take care of her. And what does he do? He applies for a job with the WPA, but it wasn't that easy. He had to prove that he was a citizen of the United States. And the way that he could do that not, was not by showing birth certificates or anything. So many of our uh, migrants that didn't have those documents on hand. Uh, he had to have two people vouch for him. And so he, uh, uh, he has, he has the, the priest from the local church, uh, La Milagrosa, uh, and he has a brother-in-law who was able to vouch for him. And so he gets the job. And where is he sent? He is sent to Columbus Avenue to work with the New York City Department of Sewers. A grueling job. Uh, he's working four days a week. He's making $15 uh, uh, a week. Uh, but it is enough to support his wife and to keep his child at home. Um, so that what I found really interesting about the, the blogs is how you can begin in one place and it takes you someplace else. Um, so there's a lot of material here to cover. Um, uh, so uh, let's go on to the, uh, uh, to the next uh, part of the program. Hi again. I'll describe now the rest of the blogs that cover after the period when Puerto Rican migrants started arriving in large numbers after World War II. Um, the first blog discusses something that's been talked about a lot, uh, actually, and should be researched even better by others. Uh, and it's the question of the reception of Puerto Ricans in New York City. And um, the emphasis traditionally has been on the negative reception, including some very hostile attacks. And I cover that. Uh, I'm adding to some of the discussion that colleagues have provided. But I also put the question, the larger question of how Puerto Ricans were received in New York in the late 40s and early 50s in a larger, in a much larger context, including uh, positive assessments and welcoming assessments and battles of solidarity and support, not just led by Puerto Ricans, but by others. And, and in that sense, the world of progressive, liberal, and leftist politics welcomed Puerto Ricans. And that didn't completely dissolve with the conservative trend of the late 1940s. So what I try to provide is a bigger picture on a debate, the debates that Puerto Ricans produced including many, many supporters uh, and many, many allies right, that Puerto Ricans then engage with in their own efforts to be successful as workers uh, and as political people, right? And there's, you know, a fair amount of examples of, of those uh, efforts. Uh, it's called bad press, good press. <laughs> um, the following section is along the similar lines as following blog, and it talks about the anti-discrimination establishment. In most discussions of discrimination law 
came after the Civil Rights Act, but in New York, New York had its own Civil Rights Act that began right after World War II. Uh, in other words, New York had a longstanding Jewish and Black anti-discrimination law practices and movements, uh, and Puerto Ricans became connected to, to, to those people, organizations, networks, resources, lawyers, etc. during the 50s, um, even earlier, actually. Uh, and one of the main examples that I provide is the State Committee Against Discrimination, which at first was not that important to Puerto Ricans, but by the mid 50s became really important to Puerto Ricans. Uh, and I give some examples from those materials, which are drawn from the State Archive, the New York State Archive, for example. Um, there are other efforts at uh, anti-discrimination that go into the 1960s. And at that point, Puerto Rican leaders, especially second generation Puerto Rican leaders were, were actually being named to positions of investigators and heads like Filiberto Herrera and being uh, of the different entities that dealt with anti-discrimination efforts in the city and in the state. Um, the next section discusses an important institution what historians usually call the Migration Division, which was the office of the government of Puerto Rico in New York, initially led by Clarence Sr. and then by Jose Montserrat. And I think this is where I depart from some of the standard views. Uh, and this will be some space for controversy here. Uh, and I argue that the Migration Division was a complex, contradictory thing. And actually allowed Montserrat to become one of the most important civil rights leaders of the Puerto Rican community during the 1960s. There is a lot of information in the blogs about the efforts towards civil rights, but also towards labor rights and labor movements. And in that sense, the next blog is critical because it has to do with the unions. And the following one to that is the fight against ex exploitation which is this big campaign led by the labor movement in support of mostly Puerto Rican workers who were exploited by racketeer controlled, uh, mobster controlled unions uh, and other corrupt unions in the late 50s. And this was became the center of union activism in New York, the fight against exploitation. So these two blogs and their sections cover how Puerto Ricans joined unions, participated in unions, different generations of Puerto Ricans, in other words, Puerto Ricans who had been there for a long time, their children, and those who had been arriving in the late 40s and early 50s in different ways. They had different characteristics, but they all participated in unions and to some extent built this kind of dual system of support on an ethnic basis and support on a class basis that involved the unions, their allies, many of which were Jewish, many of which were former communists or, or uh, had been members of the Communist Party and other progressive leaders, some of which were not communists and were still very much part of the working class movement in New York and willing to be allies in the struggles of Puerto Ricans in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Um, then the next blog is shifts a little bit towards the question of community life and youth. And it's more of a kind of exploratory piece on Puerto Rican riots from distant communities and in, including many riots that are not very well known. I didn't include them all. Uh, I have many, many more, but that research is the most, most recent material that I've been working on. So I wanted to just provide a little bit of a sense of how policing uh, and community life for working class youth mattered in a very different way uh, and response to police abuse from kind of specific communities in the late 60s, well, throughout the 60s and also in the early 70s. Um, and that pretty much wraps it up. The blog site has or will have links to many documents, many images, oral histories held at Centro, documents from other places, and um, a teaching guide, a bibliography, uh, and uh, I look forward to your questions about uh, the material both now and and later through email. Thank you. There's so much information. Uh, and of course, 
this is only an introduction to, to uh, the work that Dr. Lauria has done. Um, but I can see I can see the richness in it and, and, and how uh, how valuable it's going to be. Um, even to people who are just doing research for the first time, but I think mostly of our students who need to have this this need to have this history, need to have this background because uh, when we take the time to uncover the past and uh, re re restructure it and restore it and present it, uh, these to me are um, are are. Um, the weapons that uh, that we have at our at our, at our fingertips uh, to be able to say who we are, what we have done, uh, who, where we belong. Um, but uh, but in any case, in this particular section, there are there are two things that that stand out. One is discrimination, and 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 yes, I yes, there were. Um, already organizations set up. I'm thinking of uh, the Civil Rights Commission that is set up in 1954, somewhere around there. And, and it is particularly um, established uh, to, to fight uh, discrimination uh, in, in employment. Um, but there is also uh, a, a, an, another form of discrimination that, um, uh, that, that no one actually realized was there or could actually form institutions to, to fight. And, and that type of discrimination uh, was institutional. Um, it came through the school system because uh, we were tracked uh, and Puerto Rican kids were told that they could not go to Stuyvesant, could not go to major, uh, this is in the 1950s already, could not go to um, uh, major academic centers uh, could not go to the privates, to the Ivies, uh, because after all, it would be too much money for their family. And we were given all kinds of excuses. And, uh, and, the, and, and, and there's also that uh, institutional uh, discrimination uh, when, uh, uh, for example, for us kids who were growing up during that period, we were the ones who translated. So we knew what the social worker was telling us and how we had to then uh, launder that, we had to sanitize that in order to tell our aunts or our uncles or our mothers. But we knew that there was a sense there of uh, disrespect, a sense of, um, uh, it really was true that social workers would visit the home and look in the closets to make sure you didn't have a television. Um, so that strikes me, the whole issue. And, and, and also the fact that in order to combat discrimination, communities have to come up with their own ideas. And one of the women that I want to talk about uh, is just such a person. Uh, she actually fits uh, the mold for so many of the, uh, of the issues that Dr. Lauria has brought up uh, in this section. I also wanna talk about the role of family, the role of labor organizing and family. And maybe Camacho, you can show that first image. I think it's the other one. Um, thinking particularly of the, uh, of the, the role of, uh, of family, uh, you know, this here is a, a picture of, um, do you all, I don't know if you recognize her, but this is Antonia Pantoja as a girl. And uh, where she used to talk, uh, she actually describes herself as a skinny and uh, sickly and uh, uh, having to fight for an education. But, um, but one of the things that she did, she did accomplish was that she was an avid, voracious reader and would read all of her grandfather's socialist material. And so that she was very, very well schooled in, uh, in civil rights uh, and the right of the individual uh, of, in, in issues of justice and issues of, of race. Um, and uh, of course, uh, this little girl grows up to be the founder of institutions, the visionary who finds, who founds Aspira and I'd like that connection between her and her grandfather. And, and, and now if we can go on to the, 
to the next image, um, Aida Ines Lopez um, was a, uh, uh, and uh, this is a picture of her that, uh, that was posted online with her obituary. Uh, she was one of the major labor leaders uh, in New York City. Uh, she, uh, she was vice president of the, um, of the union for department, um, department store workers. Uh, she went on to, uh, to be treasurer of the city council, uh, union labor organizations. And, uh, and, and she talks about how her father um, uh, was one of the founders of the Maritime Association and her mother was, a, of course, belonged to the International Ladies' Garments uh, Union. And, and, and I could see that connection. I could see, I could see how you would go into the second generation uh, and you bring these ideas uh, and they're acted upon in ways that was impossible to do earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking particularly of Patricia Rodriguez, who was a, a union organizer in Brooklyn. Uh, she was born in 1922. She came to New York right after the uh, Second World War, uh, raised five children, became a fixture on the, uh, on the picket line, uh, always wanted to be a nurse, and she became a nurse's, nurse's aide. Uh, and she was, uh, she was a member of 1199, but she was also a community organizer and was uh, uh, part of the, uh, of the group that organized a number of hometown clubs, particularly Los Hijos de Guayanilla. Um, she, um, uh, she was politically active and uh, she joined forces with Antonia, uh, Antonia Dennis, someone that we should have more information about. And they created La Casa de Puerto Rico in Brooklyn on Hoyt Street um, because they knew that they needed to have cultural historical institutions for their children because they weren't going to get it anyplace else. And so uh, Patricia uh, Rodriguez uh, was also politically, politically involved in the campaigns of people who um, who, uh, who, who, who lobbied for bilingual, uh, bilingual voting ballots. Uh, she was someone who, uh, while she was organizing uh, uh, on the picket line, forming a union, she always had her children with her. And this is another part of the, of, of the, the family configuration of union organizing. And so, um, I, uh, uh, so one of the important things, and this and this this addresses the the bad press. Uh, she and a group of politicians and a group of community organizers had actually gone to Washington to demonstrate uh, in support of Salvador Agron, uh, the the teenager who was labeled the Cape Man, uh, who had been sentenced to death uh, for uh, for for uh, a, a killing. And, um, and they lobbied for him because uh, they felt that the press was so negative uh, about this, this young man. Uh, and they actually won uh, in terms of having his uh, a life, uh, a death sentence was commuted to life in prison so that she was that active. And so I look at that and I say, well, you know what? Uh, if, 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 if all of this, all of this activity is, uh, uh, all of this activism is there and it's passed on to the next generation. You have to wonder, uh, well, what is the difference between a woman who is a nurse's aide, member of 1199, out on the picket line, every chance that she gets, she was described as a fixture and, uh, and a college president. Well, I'm gonna tell you to quote Ruth Bader Ginsburg, one generation. One of the five children was Milga Morales Nadal, who was one of the founders at Brooklyn College of the Department of Puerto Rican Studies. Milga Morales Nadal not only founded the Department of Puerto Rican Studies, in years to come, she went on to become Dean of Students and Vice President for Student Affairs one generation. 
uh, we are going to uh, open up for questions and answers. So um, uh, we uh, let me go back to Carlos. Uh, thank you, Virginia. And yes, I would like to invite Aldo uh, to come on live so we can engage some of the questions that are beginning to come up uh, on the Q&A board. And I think that the first one is, uh, is very telling. Uh, it reads, for the waves of working class migrants, both post-World War I and post-World War II, did you find any evidence that dark-skinned Puerto Ricans were excluded from certain types of blue-collar jobs? Uh, did Puerto Rican worker leaders overly discuss race issues, both with, with respect to the dominant culture and within Puerto Rican uh, culture and community? So, um, yes, the, the options for darker-skinned Puerto Ricans were more limited, uh, especially in... Um, people facing jobs uh, and not so much in industrial jobs, but as with discrimination against African-Americans, uh, positions of clerk, uh, positions of public service. Um, and the second part of the question about um, raising color as a, as, a, as a color is very much present in many, many discussions both in terms of passing as white, but also in terms of movement discussions of what to do uh, about the additional discrimination faced by dark skinned or black identified people, right? Um, and that's part of the leftist progressive movement as well as part of the emerging civil rights movement and Puerto Ricans listening to the black movement in the 50s and certainly is on the table in the 60s. But it's not consistent. There's no single, some people don't want to talk about this. So it's, it's a very large community. I think that's part of the intent of the blogs is to differentiate stories. It's a community that arrives at maybe a million people in multiple generations. If you count the third generation, which is uncounted, it's well over a million by 1970 something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the, the inspiration or the motivation for the blogs and the book is to is to find the spaces where maybe it's talked about and maybe it isn't, right? So there is that kind of diversity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, two more questions, one from our uh, colleague Andres Torres uh, and also Annalisa Torres who says in a second question about uh, organizing, uh, uh, organizing in different sectors and uh, Andres uh, Andy Torres asked, uh, uh, do you look at how the shift from the manufacturing sector to services in the New York City economy affect the Puerto Rican labor organizing and or militancy? And similarly, Annalisa Torres asked, uh, do you have any information as to the role uh, of Puerto Rican hotel workers in the 1920s organizing within that sector? So that, that, that might be an interesting uh, comparison uh, between those time periods. Um. Again, it's, it's, my tendency is to uh, not answer these questions wholesale. For workers who remained in industry, the uh, industry remained important in different sectors in New York in the 1960s and even in the early 70s. And some unions were less militant because of the you know, ongoing deindustrialization. Others became more aggressive with their uh, kind of uh, organizing drives, even as industry is leaving. So it depends, right? Um, so there, there is no wholesale shift of, there's a lot of Puerto Ricans still working in industry through the 60s in, in manufacturing, right? Uh, in general, uh, the, what's gonna happen in the 70s is that the city goes bankrupt. And that affects all the unions, not just the ones that were suffering from deindustrialization. So there's these larger vectors that don't simply belong to the Puerto Rican community, right? Um, so generally speaking, um, Puerto Ricans did a lot of activism that we still don't know about, right? So to some extent, we'd have to answer the question about activism during the 70s and 80s, uh, which we don't have a lot of research on that. Right. Well, um, I think, and then the, yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Finish. Finish. 
Oh, well, I, I was going to go to the next question. So if you want to, if you want to. No, then don't. Let me, <laughs> let me get this in before I forget. Okay. Um, the, uh, I'm thinking in terms of organizing uh, one great example of how the community was organizing was uh, were, were the teachers. Uh, I mean, imagine that uh, in 1949, you've got uh, 10 people who are from Puerto Rico who have teaching credentials and who are given special, uh, uh, um, special employment uh, to, become, um, to become intermediaries in the school system because they, they spoke Spanish. They were not allowed to teach. They were only allowed to work with the American teacher in order to uh, facilitate uh, the communication uh, between the teacher and that student. And the second part of their job was as community organizers. They're supposed to go according to the job description. Um, remember, these, these, this really, this is what gets me. These people were, were qualified teachers in Puerto Rico, but they're not being recognized uh, in New York City as, uh, as either intellectually capable. And of course they had an accent. And in New York City, you could not teach in the public schools if you had a Spanish accent. Um, these, not, these 10, uh, they were called substitute auxiliary teachers hired in 1949, within 10 years grow to over a hundred. And uh, they begin to organize. They, they begin to create their own organizations within the larger teachers' organizations, which were mostly Jewish controlled uh, uh, by the 50s. And, um, and they, they grow uh, in power uh, and, they, uh, and, and they also become, um, uh, they also begin to lobby for licensure. And they are the ones who begin to create a bilingual education license. Now the bilingual education movement is one of the most successful and one of the most important uh, areas of, 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 of organizing workers in our community. And it's a part of our history that we don't even tend to think about it. So that I, I'll, I, every now and then, if I go into a meeting and somebody stands up and 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 uh, is a, you know Russian-looking uh, accent, and he says, "Boy, if it wasn't for bilingual education in New York, I would have never been able to graduate from the City University of New York." Uh, the bilingual program is started by Puerto Rican teachers, and um, and they they become active. And here's the other thing about it that I find fascinating, and maybe this, this will lead us a little bit into how organizing is done. Um, when they're, they're, the part of their job that is the, the, to work with the community, yeah. they were bringing parents into the school, teaching them skills so that they could go out and work. They actually had sewing machines brought into some of the schools to teach parents how to sew on a sewing machine so they could go out and work. They also radicalized them. They explained to them what was happening in the school system, why their kids were dropping out, <clears throat> the importance of having teachers who understood both languages. And they would, they would have busloads of parents going up to Albany uh, to lobby and demonstrate uh, for the benefit of their of, of the schools, uh, so that this is an area of organization that we have not looked at very very clearly. It is definitely very nationalistic. It is very Puerto Rican. It is very very much involved with the issues of language rights, and this is one of the first communities that actually does something and brings about topples the system. It actually topples the system. And today you can go into any school, you're gonna find Puerto Rican teachers who were probably the products of that movement. So that's one way of organizing. Thank you for letting me get that one in. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Virginia. Um, Aldo, there are a number of questions that you've indicated you're going to answer live. Uh, 
you know, you definitely yes. go ahead. They're coming. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're coming Thank in. Thank you they're for all in. these wonderful questions. Yes, yes. <laughs> I yes. hope somebody's going to save these questions so I can think them through a little better. Um, let's see, where was I? I, I, I think that uh, the one by Gene Stubbs about the cigar makers. Uh, would that be Yes, personal? Gene Stubbs and Jeff. Um, Gene, the chronology, uh, there's Puerto Ricans in the 19th century, but it's a very small community. Mm -hmm. So my kind of center of gravity was to, to start with when there's enough people that they're kind of creating a community and enough. So this is one of the curious things about this early 1900s is that there, there's, they have already multiple centers that don't, don't know of, of each other's presence, so to speak, right? So the middle-class migrants don't know about the proletarian migrants. Uh, that have been there already in smaller numbers, right? That kind of thing. Uh, and the end date has to do with, well, has to do with practicality. I mean, the original study was going to end with the crisis of the city in the mid 70s and the crisis of industry and unions in the mid 70s. Uh, and basically all of those themes associated with the urban crisis. And that's why the project includes, for example, references to riots. Uh, that's going to be in the second volume that I'm still working on, and I'm not sure how much of that's going to happen towards the tail end of the chronology. But the 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 great arch of this is the presence in large numbers, and the arch the life of manufacturing as a center of gravity of New York City, right? Uh, and it's inspired uh, by the work of Joshua Freeman, who's uh, has you know one of the New York City's most important books uh, for the 20th century, uh, working class New York, right? Uh, then on the migration division, um, of when, let me see if I answered completely. Uh, uh, the, the 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 Cubans are are in, the Cubans are obviously in New York, and there there is a lot of information on. Italian, Spanish, Puerto Rican, Cuban connections, some of them originating in Tampa um, uh, and how they play out in the industry. But soon enough, it's mostly Puerto Ricans, right? Uh, but there's there's Cubans and Spaniards sprinkled out throughout the blog, but especially throughout the much longer version of that that's in the book manuscript, right? Because all of this is based on different aspects of book, of book, book manuscripts. Uh, that have been trimmed down and simplified, right? And, and maybe made a little bit more uh, accessible, right? Uh, so the question about the migration division, uh, the migration division is, is one of those things where I kind of differ from the, usually how it's treated, especially through uh, Montserrat and his role in the 60s and even in the 50s in relation to even Clarence Senior's links to the labor movement. Uh, so, you know, there's some controversy there. If you want, you can write to me and I can give you some references, but basically the, the perception is a migration division as a tool of the Puerto Rican government from the island, Luis Muñoz Marin and the Populares versus an instrument of community development through whatever force forms, right? Uh, and that's the, the, the controversy, right? Um, and it's discussed in the blog in some detail. But a lot of these things are look are I hope to become you know to turn into discussions right into into things that can be talked about and for others to research and come up with alternative positions right. Uh, and, and, and on that point, Aldo, uh, there are a number of questions on the on the Q and A that talk about you know, where can we find more or what needs to be researched more on? So based on the, the work that you have done for the blog, uh, what are some of the lacuna? What are some of the voids uh, uh, that need to be filled and where there might be uh, resources to, you know, uh, uh, fill yeah. in that, that, that void or those voids? Yes. Um, one of the benefits of doing this research was that I, you know, I already had a lot of experience doing research and archives and books and so forth and, and kind of taking for granted that I knew that I would find more than what I expected. And in fact, I, you know, 
there, I definitely found more materials than, than what I expected. And probably, you know, there's six books in here somewhere uh, that, that other people could pursue in more detail. Uh, in fact, I started writing a list of potential dissertations and books that come, can come out of the different archival materials that I've looked at. And I would say that one of the, the strongest collections, uh, I mean, I had the privilege of a lot of time to do this research. So there's that, there's an institutional context, um, but Centro has magnificent collections, including the, the materials from the migration division itself which are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boxes. And, and you have to sit with hundreds and hundreds of hundreds of boxes to get the story right, right? You can't rely, for example, on the annual reports of the Migration Division, right? Uh, and uh, the same thing with the Jesus Colon papers, right? And then if you add in the unions, and I emphasize manufacturing unions that had a kind of a militant tradition, there's other unions that I didn't cover in, in much detail. Uh, and those archives are there as well, right? There's many moments of alliances. For example, the case, the Puerto Rican cases that are in the State Commission Against Discrimination archive in Albany. I'm not gonna have a chance, even in the book, to get into the detail that I want to with those those file cases, right? Of discrimination cases. And, and all those cases gonna be used with different uh, turns to look at race, to look at gender, to look at language, to look at uh, the how Puerto Ricans partook in legal and kind of procedural uh, institutional context, how they talked about their their rights and their involvement. Um, there's just massive amount of material waiting for people to look at. Um, so I'm hoping that the polemics will be there with anything I say, you know, welcome, more than welcome to challenge, but also further, further development, right, uh, in many different directions. And I'm more than glad to help, help out with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, terrific. Um, uh, I, I see another question, uh, uh, Virginia and, and, and Aldo as well, and it talks a little bit about, you know, you, you focus as being Puerto Ricans in New York City, uh, but what connections there may have been with other Puerto Rican communities elsewhere uh, in uh, throughout the nation? Um, you know, the, the reference in the question is specifically to Chicago, uh, but Chicago or anywhere else? Um, yeah, go ahead, Bettina. No, I'm just, I, I was, I've been thinking a, a, a lot about um, if there were connections with the workers' organizations in, uh, in the union organizations, uh, the workers' organizations in New York and other parts of the country. And, um, and it seems to me that there are, but we really don't have a good idea of where they are. One of the uh, uh, one of the advantages that we've had in looking at the 19th century, for example, looking at Patria, the newspaper, is that we have a whole section of uh, the not only classified ads uh, that give us an indication of what connections were being made with uh, who was importing uh, stuff to New York and, and what was being exported and what, what, what national connections were being made. But we also have, uh, for example, a listing of all of the, uh, of all of the clubs uh, of, under the Cuban Revolutionary Party, and we know where they are. And we know that the connections are Philadelphia, they're Boston, uh, there are uh, connections in the South, uh, Louisiana, uh, New Orleans, we have that information. I suspect that those connections exist, but I'm not exactly sure of, of, of what they are. Now in the 1960s, you have uh, uh, radical student connections uh, between Chicago and New York and uh, California and Texas. And those we can document very clearly. So I don't know, what have you found on that? It depends on the period. Um, the, for example, yeah. the when the Communist Party was 
the strongest in the Hispanic community in the late 30s and early 40s. Jesus Colon was in charge of building the network of the International Workers Order. And that meant a kind of a popular frontish organization that was not meant to produce party members or union militants, but kind of worker, it was referred to as a fraternal organization for solidarity in working class communities and to try to bridge the many linguistic and racial and ethnic divisions that the people that came together under this progressive umbrella uh, of those years, right? And the IWO became the Hispanic section, named itself the Cervantes Society. And actually, Jesus Colon made a proposal, uh, and I discussed this, I don't think it's in the blog, but it's in the book. Uh, he, he thought it was successful enough and big enough to create a, a Spanish-speaking popular front under the Cervantes Society banner. And that meant that they had, they managed clubs which operated autonomously, but there were IWO Spanish-speaking branches and the branches sometimes were unsuccessful, so they closed, but there were in Chicago, they were in Ohio, they had Spaniards, they had Mexican-Americans, they were in California. Uh, and obviously the most successful ones were New York City, where the IWO kind of had under its umbrella, including family programming, teams, dances, Dia de las Madres, all kinds of things. This is why I call this a cultural world as well as a, as a political world. Uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of Spanish-speaking people. And I, I try to estimate how much they were, because we know how many paid dues, but the dues was to be part of the IWO as an insurance company, which is what it originally started as, run by the Communist Party, uh, which is, you know, the, 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 that example, I think, brings to mind the intent of these blogs, which is to, to give us a, a, a strong sense of how radically different the world New York City has been in these other decades, right? Where you you not just have to ask questions about Puerto Ricans, but also ask questions about context, which is completely unfamiliar to, to what we have now or even 20 or 30 years ago, right? So a world in which the Communist Party could run an insurance company that was the basis for a mutual aid society that had language sections, that had hundreds of thousands of workers in that world, organizing culturally, linguistically, and coming out to rallies and events and so forth. Well, what kind of world was that, right? We need to, you know, and then it's gone, right? Then it shifts to something else, right? Uh, uh, there's a question here by, yeah, go ahead. If, if we're going to continue with the q and Aldo and Virginia, mm -hmm. uh, however, I would like to share with the audience a short tutorial on how best to take advantage of this recent addition to the Central's Resources, uh, resources for Scholarship and Engagement, that is the Centro e-Journal. So I would like to ask Mike and my colleague Camacho to run uh, this tutorial for a few minutes, and then we will go back to the Q&A. Welcome to Centro's e-Journal Navigation and Structure Tutorial. The following presentation will show you how to navigate the eJournal site on our webpage and get a closer look at this digital humanities initiative. This is the homepage for Centro. From here, you can access numerous resources, including the eJournal projects. To find the main page for Centro's eJournal, simply hover over the Publications tab located on the horizontal gray bar towards the top of the page. You will see a panel with various options, including the Centro eJournal tab. Click to continue. After clicking on the Centro eJournal tab, this is the page you will find. Here you will find the projects currently on view, along with their hero image and a short description. Click on one of the Explore the Projects buttons to access a project. For the following examples, we will be using Aldo Lauria's project on Puerto Rican labor. This is the homepage for said project. From here, you may access a number of tabs, those lined up horizontally towards the top, gallery, bibliography, oral history, timeline, maps, offer a focused look on some of the components that make up the project as a whole. 
Those tabs lined up vertically towards the right under the title Puerto Rican Labor are links that directly correspond with the chapters of the project's principal narrative. When you click on the Gallery tab, this is the page we are presented. For this project, the gallery is configured as such. The links presented above each image correspond to a chapter within the general narrative. Clicking on these links will take you to the corresponding chapter, just as the links lined up vertically to the right of the page. However, when you click on the image itself, you can see in gallery form all of the images being used. Click on one of the images to see. Having clicked on one of the images presented, you are now offered a gallery view of the images entailed with each project. Within this panel, you can navigate back and forth through the images used in that chapter. When you click on the bibliography link, you are directed to this page, which is a straightforward presentation. When you click on the timeline tab, it leads us to this page. Timeline provides an interactive model in which the author highlights specific events mentioned within the general narrative. Using the hours on the panel, you can navigate through these points in time, while still seeing the events listed towards the bottom of the panel in chronological order. Now, let's see the oral history tab. For the Oral History tab, we'll be using Harry Franke's project on Puerto Ricans in the military. When you click on the Oral History tab, you are presented with links to past recordings made at Centro. Here you can listen to first-hand accounts from people involved with the subject of this project. Let's now click on the Maps tab. The Maps tab creates an interactive platform where you can see key events in relation to the geographical location of this. With regards to its presentation sequence, the events can be placed in chronological order within the Maps framework. Here we go back to Aldo Lauria's project on Puerto Rican labor. On this page, you see the introduction to general narrative. With the general narrative, the structure includes the main text to the project. To see an example, let's click on the Middle Class Empire tab aligned vertically to the right of the page. As you read the text for each part, you can continue to access the next chapter by using the tabs aligned vertically to the right of the page. You can also use the smart link located at the bottom of each chapter. Here we have the homepage for Harry Franke's project. Again, we can see the various tabs available on the horizontal line towards the top left of the page, as well as vertically to the right of the page. Let's go ahead and click on the introduction tab to the right of the page. Here we have the first chapter of Harry Franke's main narrative. You'll notice on the right side of the page, box tabs for multimedia related content and resources by author. These tabs offer additional content for different purposes, such as linking relevant text from within Centro, providing sources to authors, books, and their publications, and connect videos from outside sources. For Harry Franke's project, he used a timeline of events separate from the Timeline tab function to organize his content as a way of presenting all the chapters with a short description within his intro page in addition to the vertical list of chapters already available to the right of the page. Here's another example of the general narratives view using Harry Franke's project. Notice the various tabs made available to the right of the page as well as links towards the bottom of the main text. Let's see an example of Noralis Ruiz Project homepage. Let's click on Ana Vélez Mitchell tab at the homepage. Here you see an example of Noralis Ruiz narrative page. Now let's go back and see another example of a project homepage. Here's an example of Ismael Garcia's project homepage. Let's click on the Background to Farm Labor Migration tab. Here's an example of Ismael Garcia's narrative page. Notice that with a more image-oriented narrative, the text goes together almost as captions. As you can see, the e journal exhibits offer multiple and dynamic ways to display a digital humanity project and offers various possibilities for the authors to lay out their work. For more information about Centro's e-journal initiative, please write to ejournal at hunter.cuny.edu. That's ejournal at hunter.cuny.edu. Thank you for joining us.
this was a tutorial that shows the audience how it is that they can utilize the resources. It's also an encouragement for scholars who would like to do work that can be presented as digital exhibits and also uh, central e-journal uh, uh, documents uh, to do so. So um, we do have uh, a few <laughs> questions to ask as well. Um, and uh, I would like to perhaps, you know, go, go from the very bottom. In relation again to the migration division, perhaps Aldo and, and Virginia, uh, what benefits did the Office of the Government of Puerto Rico provide Puerto Rican New Yorkers in the 1940s and the 1950s? The office was opened in the context of the bad press, good press debate, uh, where coverage of the Puerto Rican presence was politicized in the middle of a bitter fights between leftists and rightists in New York City, right? And um, the office was opened as a part of a public relations issue. It was open to produce research. It was open to facilitate the different kinds of integration and participation of the Puerto Rican migrants as the migration was growing from the island, right? And um, eventually the office became kind of very sophisticated and relied more on Puerto Ricans who had grown up in, in New York, second generation, um, for, for at least some of the important uh, work. Uh, they opened uh, offices that had to do with education. They had an employment service where people could go and get a job. Uh, referral. They worked with the unions. They worked with the city government. Uh, they came to employ a hundred and some people uh, in, within the office. And uh, Clarence Sr. was kind of a, a officer of the Socialist Party, so that he had leftist leanings and many working class connections in the union movement. So he tried to work through that in the early 50s. And then Monserrat uh, also worked different angles. It's really too much, you know, it's in the blog, the, the, um, which would be his biggest contribution, uh, organizing these community groups that then had a life of their own, uh, organizing a Cumbre umbrella group, uh, that, uh, he directed, but that had, you know, dozens and dozens of people at their summits, and then they partook in other campaigns and struggles, especially when civil rights uh, movement kind of kicks in in the very late 50s and early 60s. Um, the fighting with the city over issues, pushing to place Puerto Ricans in better jobs, uh, in uh, public service functions, negotiating with social service agencies, and solving there, there is this is one of the most amazing things in the migration division archives the letters that they got from puerto ricans uh complaining requesting explaining i mean that alone uh, for somebody in cultural studies it's just shocking that this hasn't been looked at carefully they ran the farm labor uh uh, program that Ismael is going to has a blog about and has a recent book about and will be presenting on uh, soon enough uh, through Centro. But the letters and you know dozens and dozens of letters of Puerto Ricans in very diverse circumstances, and and you can also see the response, right? They, we can do nothing about this, one, or let's some send somebody to that jail to see if we can get the guy a lawyer or whatever. I mean, it's hundreds and hundreds of stories uh, over, over years and years and years, right? Uh, so I would say that that and, and, the, and the newspapers are two of the most unused sources uh, for the history of Puerto Ricans. Yeah. My, my notes on the migration division boxes that I looked at is a thousand pages of notes. I'm not exaggerating, <laughs> okay? So, and of course I couldn't possibly have used it all in, these, in any of this stuff, so. So one single scholar may not be able to use <laughs> all of these resources in a professional life, right? 
Uh, therefore, you know, what can we do to encourage, you know, up and coming scholars to, you know, access, you know, established scholars to uh, disseminate this trove uh, and continue the, the, the research that, you know, has begun by previous mm -hmm. generation. I mean, uh, the, the work that Virginia herself uh, has done over the decades, you know, was pathbreaking and it has continued on. Uh, how can we then continue uh, that process? Well, it's, that's a political question and that's a scholarly question, right? On the political side, we are, don't have a lot of PhDs in the pipeline or programs that produce Puerto Ricans interested in this sort of research in New York and other communities in the US. So that's an open question, right? That's for us to fight for uh, individually and collectively. And, and uh, everybody's been doing that, including Virginia, who's a pioneer in this kind of putting it on the map and making them read it, right? Uh, including a lot of US historians uh, that don't still still don't have us on the syllabus, right? Um, and the scholarly question is, I mean, at least, you know, with visible people that you can identify in the central resources to ask us to network to not hide if your interests, if you're a graduate student or if you're doing a master's and um, to, you know, we're here for that, right? The whole point of this is to promote research discussion and debate. Virginia? I, yeah, I think one of, the, one of the issues that we have to face is that we do not have faculty uh, in positions to uh, guide dissertations uh, to influence uh, the choices that students make uh, in graduate school about the directions in which to go. And that is a role that uh, Centro has to help out with. Uh, uh, Centro has uh, the archives. Uh, it needs to have uh, uh, researchers on board. It needs to begin to produce more scholarly material that would point the way. Uh, you are, uh, Aldo is right. Uh, our work is still looked upon as, um, oh yeah, let's add this chapter uh, because we wanna make sure we have a Puerto Rican, um, you know, Puerto Rican point of view or, um, so that uh, we need to fortify Centro in this direction and Centro needs to fortify us and uh, you know, fight for our presence, a meaningful presence at, the, at those levels of the university that produce scholars. Mm -hmm. We do not have that. And, um, and I'm, I'm waiting for that to happen. Yes. So, thank you, thank you, Virginia. Uh, uh, with that, uh, we we are actually running out of time. Uh, you know, we, this has been a wonderful, wonderful webinar and a wonderful presentation and discussion. I thank you, Aldo. I thank you, Virginia, uh, and I thank the audience for uh, joining us uh, this evening in this insightful uh, 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 engagement. Um, you know that also highlights what are often forgotten aspects of our history as a people in the United States. Um, for the, so thank you Aldo Lauria Santiago, thank you Virginia Sanchez Corral uh, for your work, your continued work, your continued dedication uh, to the scholarship on Puerto Rican studies. If you want uh, uh, um, uh, more information about uh, 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 our resources or what have you, you may want to see our uh, web page and I'll show you this slide momentarily. Uh, we are also going to be asking you to provide us with a uh, short survey about how to improve uh, these offerings to you. Uh, uh, so if you want to follow us on social media, you can follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, Instagram, et cetera, at uh, these links provided here and, our, uh, and at our main website. Uh, with that, we conclude our webinar this evening.